she has hundreds of songs memorized every night. And so, uh, again, we are so blessed, Betty, that you have been here with us. Uh, if you would like to stay, she's going to play them again at the next service. And so uh, uh, we are very thankful. Can we just tell her again how thankful we are that she is here? I'm going to try to get through two verses today, but I don't know if I will. I hope you have your Bibles. Uh, and let's go to Nehemiah chapter 3. Now, just a real quick recap. Uh, in Nehemiah chapter 1, he found out that his city of heritage that he had never been to. Remember, uh, they went into captivity 80, or 85 years plus 55 years, and no one was ever able to do the math. How many years is that? 100, how many? 85 plus 55 is how many? And during that entire time period, he discovered that that's where Nehemiah grew up. That's all he has ever known was growing up under the Medo Persian realm. And so, but his heart still beat for Jerusalem. And let me just say this in hindsight it doesn't matter what city you live in, if you have a heart for God, it can still come through. It doesn't matter what country you live in. If you have a heart for God, it can still come true. And although we don't know, know, know anything about his mom and his dad, or uh, any of them, we just know this, that somehow or another, this man develops a heart for God. It's very reminiscent of a person by the name of Abram, who is living in Ur of the Chaldees, very similar, if not identical, location. And God calls him out of Ur of the Chaldees. His parents are idol worshippers. His uncles are idol worshippers. And he begins the entire Jewish nation through the children or a child of an idol worshiper. So no matter how rough the situation may be, no matter how difficult the child may be, that a child can grow up and learn how to love God regardless of the parent. God is still sovereignly in control. Now isn't it better when you have parents who will train their children up in the ways of the Lord so that when they are old they will not depart from them. And so he found out that the city of his heritage and the graves of his fathers and his father's fathers was lying in ruin, and he found that out to one of his siblings. Uh, he decides to go back. Now, you would say, how can you go back to someplace you've never been? I, you know that you can go back to God, meaning you can go back to where he is. You know, going back does not mean going back to where you were. Going back to go means going back to where you need to be. I need to get back to that, even though you may not have ever been there. And so you go back to God. And many people come and they, and they realize that Jesus loves them and called them and has saved them. And they go back because from the beginning of time God has already called their name. So they're going back to pre-creation to say, I will be what God has called me. And I will respond how God will want me to. And so he gets there. It took him three and a half years after he gets the okay to go back to go back. And once he gets back, the first thing he does is he waits three more days. Now during that time period, the last night, he goes on a night ride. And during this night ride, he goes to the southern part of the kingdom. He goes out the valley gate. He goes all the way around, remember, past the dung gate. He makes his way over to the fountain gate. Didn't make it all the way up the water gate, but believe me, there was one. <laughs> and that was the name of it, the water gate. And since he couldn't get any farther, he rides back around to the valley gate. He comes back in the valley gate. And the next day, he tells everybody that God has given him a plan to build the walls, replenish the, 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 state, the states and the, the towers, and uh, the, secure the temple and secure the people. And the people who have been apathetic for how many years? 85 years plus 55 years? All of a sudden cries out once they see someone who's willing to stand up and say, by the grace of God, we will do this. The people all said, what? Let's do this thing. Let's do it. And that's where we pick it up today. I read a quote this week, and, and sometimes I find quotes from some of the most outlandish people. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And the quote goes like this. You can read it with me out loud if you want to. Hard work spotlights the character of people. Go ahead and read this next line with me. Some turn up their sleeves. Some turn up their noses. And some don't turn up at all. Now, anybody ever hear of this old baseball player by the name of Sam Ewing? And if you've never heard of him, Sam has got a bunch of books that are out about the, uh, he's sort of like the second generation Yogi Berra. But you know, Jesus said something different. In Matthew chapter 16, 
He looked at Peter, and after Peter said that you are the Christ, he said, upon this confession of faith, I will build my church. I will build my church on that rock. Now, that doesn't mean Petra. Did you know that Peter's name is Peter? But did you know that his Hebrew name is what? Cephas. And did you know what Cephas means? Pebble. He said, I'm going to name you Simon Peter, which means little pebble and son of pebble. And in every language Jesus gives him another name, it's always the pebble that will end up in your sandal. Now, has anybody ever had a rock in your sandal? Anybody know what I'm talking about? And he says, Peter, you're the little rock in my sandal. But it's a pot. It, it, see, when Jesus is our rock, no matter how small the world may think he is, and no matter how small you may think he is at that moment, on that rock he will build his church. And it says this, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, you know what that means? When was the last time you were attacked by a gate? I was recently, and some people have noticed a scar on my arm. I, I, I went into the health club, and uh, people, anybody ever been in a health club where everybody just throws all their stuff right on the floor? And I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to balance over two people's stuff and put my stuff into a locker, and I slid, not trying to step on their thing, and I jammed my arm right into the locking mechanism of the, of the locker. And somebody said, oh, how'd the other guy look? I said, he won. <laughs> but I have rarely been attacked by a gate. Now, you know what that means? That if you're being attacked by the gate, you're spending too much time in the opening when we are supposed to bust through the opening and go into the middle of the battlefield. And so if you are consistently being battered by the gate, it's because you're standing there in the wrong place. He says the gates of hell will not prevail. Gates don't attack unless you're in the wrong place. We should push through the gate and get into the mission. And he said the gates of hell will not prevail. But how many people show up to work? Some people show up not wanting to work. Some people just stand there and take the beating. I love the ocean. Anybody love the ocean? I love the ocean, and I love going out and playing in the waves. Anybody like going out and playing in the waves? And I like to stand there, and as the water comes in, I pretend like, I, you know, I'm Superman. <laughs> and I just jump right into the wave. Anybody do that? I do that. I battle against the waves. And you know what? I just love just battling against the waves. But, you know, I would be absolutely ludicrous if I had somebody tie me up and just let the waves battle me, buffet me. If I was just tied there and it was just wave after wave after wave after wave. See, I want to control my action in the wave. I don't want the wave to control me. And Jesus is saying the church should be controlling the world, not being controlled by the world. And if we are finding ourselves continuous, continuously being battered, maybe it's because we have not made enough forward ground. And that's what we're going to talk about today. It says, in the work of the Lord, the greatest accomplishment comes from the unity of purpose when people of diverse backgrounds, interests, and abilities join together under compelling vision. Success is achieved not because we are all of some uh, are all the same, but because of our differences are put aside to work for a greater good. One of my seminary professors said that, Dr. Tommy Lee. If we were all the I, the body of Christ is usually called by the looking at the body and saying, well, look at all the parts of the body. you got to have every part working well. If we were all the eye, we wouldn't get anywhere. If we were all the hands, we wouldn't see what to do. If we were all the feet, we'd be walking around, not seeing where to go and what to do and constantly bumping into things. Let me just say, anybody uh, live in a house where your furniture is rearranged periodically without you knowing it? <laughs> I grew up in a home where my mom never was satisfied with where anything was. Uh, whenever, and she would have my dad and I move in furniture all the time, all the time. No, 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 no. And my mom, if she, finally when she would, you know, and she would be doing this. Yeah. Anybody see that side? And I knew if I went to bed her doing that, I had better be careful if I got up in the middle of the night. Because my mom would push, and my mom's name was Betty. And let me just say, my dad's favorite song, uh, and I sang at his funeral, was Near My God. And so thank you for playing that today. Uh, and so I 
why we get up historically at night. I grew up in a three-bedroom house with only one bathroom. Anybody remember those days? And I would get up and actually trip over things. So if we're getting up and tripping over things, and we were all the feet, if we were all the eye, if we were all the hand, we wouldn't work at all. We need diverse people with diverse backgrounds which bring diverse problems. With a unifying purpose. And if we lift each other up with all of our past and finding out that in Christ we have a glorious, united future, not because we all become the same, but because we're all different. How many of you know I root for a different football team every year in pro football? Every year I'll pick a team. I usually try to pick the worst team in football because they need a fan. <laughs> I'm not going to say the Dallas Cowboys. No, I'm not going to say that. This year I'm going to be a Raiders fan. Raiders fan. I don't know why. I'm just going to be a Raiders fan. You can tar and feather me later, but that's okay. Aren't you glad that Jesus doesn't just pick his fan though, every year? Well, okay, this year you, you can be in my church. Next year, I'll know. You see, he picks us. He calls us. He nurtures us. And then what does he want us to do? He saved us while we were yet what? Sinners. sinners. And what does he want us to do? To love everybody while they're still sinners? And guess what? We stay one even after we get saved. But with unity of purpose and single-mindedness of desire, he can take people who should not be able to get along. And the, the essence that Christ is the head of the church is what people who should get along do for a common purpose. Well, with all of that in mind, let's go to Nehemiah chapter 3, verse number 1. Then, anybody want to try to say that, that name of that man? E-L-I-A-S-H-I-V, Eliashib. Eliashib. Let me just say that sometimes you can leave the I off. You can say Elishib. Now, the big purpose is the word El, and we'll take a look at Shiv in just a minute. And notice, he works on a thing called the Sheep Gate. And then they go down to the Tower of the Hundred. And then they go down to the Hanel Gate. And then they end up at the Fish Gate. And that's where we find all of that in just verses 1 and 2. Now, uh, I've got a map here. And remember last week, I showed you that he went out over here to the Valley Gate. He made his way all the way around, past the Dung Gate and the Fountain Gate. Remember, he does not make his way up to the Water Gate. A lot of you think I was kidding when I said there was a water gate. There was a water gate. And he makes his way around. But as he was at the fountain gate, on this particular side, there is the great big valley of descending death. Some people know it as the Kidron Brook Valley. In fact, up in the top, over there by the horse gate and the inspection gate, they would actually take great big buckets of water and pour it on the altar. And the blood of the sacrifices during the great feast times, sometimes during uh, the, the feast times, there would be as many as a million offerings offered. A million offerings offered. And they would be washing it down. And because of that, so much blood was gone, goes down the valleys that they call that the valley of descending darkness or death because the walls are so stained by blood that stained everyone away and still doesn't. It's still there if you go there today. And so he couldn't go any farther because it says that the, the rocks were so great that he had to get off of his horse. He comes back around. He comes all the way back over. And he goes to this place called the Hindon Valley. And if you remember from last week, it's up on a little bit of hill. And you can look over and see the entire area. And so his project was not just a, a small project. He saw the entire project. He looked at it, if you will, from God's perspective, from above and any project that is not a God's perspective project is too small of a project. And he looked at it, and then he comes down and he tells the people the next day, this is what we're going to do. And he says they're going to build. Now I want you to notice in chapter 2, the people said, let's do this, and then let's now talk about the wall builders. Because you see, so many times when you study Nehemiah, you study the wall, the building of the wall, and you're building of the wall. But the wall would have never been built if someone would not have showed up. Somebody's got to show up. And so who were the wall builders? And it says, and then. The, the words, and then, in, in Nehemiah chapter 3, verse number 1, means after they said, let's do it, they started doing it. Now, how many of us know that when we say, okay, I'll do it, and I'll say, all right, let's go, we go, well, I didn't mean now. You know, a martyr will look at me and 
and say, uh, well, let's go ahead and get the trash out to the street. And I go, I'll do that. How? You know, I mean, I still got the garbage man's not coming until tomorrow. I can get up tomorrow morning and throw on a pair of slippers and run it out there. I mean, why do it, you know, early? <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's right. I want to have a relationship with the trash man. So I wait for him to come so I can say, Jesus loves you. As he, as he drives by. Yeah, thank you, David. And then it was like, all right, let's go. Let's go do this. One of the things I love about Pastor Carol is whenever something comes up at an uh, uh, elders meeting, the first thing he wants is, when are we going to start? When are we going to start? I mean, uh, he's ready to say, let's do it now. I love that about him. And, and, so, and then it says that this guy, Elisha, and the high priest are the first ones to get started I'm going to say a lot about that over the next few minutes, but I want you to notice that any time a name or a word starts with an L or ends in a Yah, it is always somehow or another God's name is in it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Is that right? Genesis 1.1. And that word there for in the beginning God is the word what? Elohim. And it means plural, in the beginning gods, because God exists singularly in three persons. Is that correct? God the Father, God the and God the, and although they are all three one, they are all three distinctively different. So whenever God talks about himself as creative and creator is always in the plural. But the, the El is the first part. So the El means God. Now isn't it remarkable that the man who is going to lead the priests in starting the project, his maiden name, if you will, the second part of his name is Ashid. Now, how many of us know what ashid means? It means restores. So here is the priest that's going to start the project, and what does his name mean? God restores. And what were they doing? Restoring the walls and restoring the gates. Is it ironic, or is it God's sovereignty and God's timing to have the right man with the right name at the right place with the right attitude doing the right job? By the grace of God, I want to be that man. And I pray that by the grace of God, you want to be that man and that woman, wherever you are too. So whatever your name is, may the reputation of your name be God restores. You have been restored by God, and you are then on mission as a restorer. Paul says this way, you have been called to the ministry of reconciliation. You don't know what that means? That because I have been made right with God, I should desire to help other people not only be made right with God, but be what? Be made right with one another. Complete restoration. And notice this, and it says, and the other priests. The high priest rose up and his brothers, the priests. Sometimes it takes someone saying, okay, let's go. Okay, let's go. Because if everybody looks for somebody, who's going to start this? I was in the army. You don't volunteer for anything. I can still remember the Three Stooges. Some of the greatest things I ever learned in life, I learned from the Three Stooges. <laughs> and the Three Stooges would stand there. Remember that? And they would stand there, and there would be a stooge on each side of the one. And they would say, all right, if you're going to, if you like to do this, step forward. And two of them would step back. Right? And then they would just leave one person forward. Now, how many times in the church when we say, there's a project we need, we need nursery workers? <laughs> oh, I've gone to meddling. We need, we need greeters at the door. We need people to help fill up the baptistry. Now, I'm not trying to guilt trip you. But what I am saying is what would happen if all of us thought somebody else is being called for that project? We need somebody to play the chimes. We need somebody to go on missions to Hawaii. Oh, Hawaii, Hawaii. <laughs> And then the other priest, so once somebody decides to do something, then other people get involved. And they're the first people to get involved. And then the high priest and his brothers stepped up. They stepped up and they built up. That's what we should be doing. Now, maybe around this church we are not building a wall, but we are wall builders. 
You know what that means? That if anybody's life has been broken down, it's our responsibility to build them up. If anybody's life has been burned down, their gates have been burned down, it's our responsibility to step up. And who should step up first? The people who are truly religious. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 12. If you are one of the strong ones, step up. Now, we don't step up to step on. We step up to lift them. And it says the first people that stepped up were the people who cared most about God. And I want you to notice, the spiritual leaders need to lead. In this day and world, we are told that leaders delegate. Now, you know, there was a very prominent product, and, and I don't know how prominent it is anymore, but their slogan was like this, you don't have to sell anything, you've just got to get 50 people under you selling something. <laughs> Anybody remember that multi-marketing campaign that was so big, especially out east? And the whole goal was to never sell anything but get people under you selling things. Now, unfortunately, that concept has crept into the church. You don't have to share your faith. You just need to have 50 people under you sharing your faith. You don't have to read the Bible. You just have to have 50 people under you reading the Bible. You don't really have to do anything. All you have to do is say, okay, this is our job. And so you need to do this, and you need to do that, you need to do this, and you need to do that, and I'll let you know when you're done. That's not the job of a leader. The job of a leader is to lead. Now, I know I told this story a few weeks ago, but I'm going to tell it again. There was this private, and he was in the heat of battle, and, and while he was in the heat of battle, all of a sudden the enemy started to approach, and so he just got scared, everybody was being shot up, and he turned around and started running back towards uh, uh, friendly lines again, and he ran and he ran and he ran, and he finally got back and he ran past this man, and the man said, hey, private, don't you salute a general when you see one? He goes, wow, I didn't know I had ran that far back. <laughs> Leaders need to be out in front of me. Now, you know, this is not the first time that the people of God through the priests of God are led by God. Let's just think about this. When they're going into the promised land, who did uh, Joshua say to go in front and get into the Jordan River when it was at flood stage? The priests. When they got to the city of Jericho, who was told to go first and march around Jericho? The priests. In other words, if the church is going to work, and, and the church, it says that the, my church, he said my church, that the gates of hell will not prevail against it, the only way for the church to work is if the spiritual leaders of your church, your elders, lead the way. Lead the way. Be praying for them. Because if they're out in front, they're also the ones who's going to take the first onslaught of the enemy. My dad landed at Omaha Beach, first wave, second aqueduct. And my dad would tell me the stories of how he had to crawl over dead bodies just to get to the shore. He says that the spiritual leaders led. But don't forget, if we were to go to Nehemiah 13, verse number 28, it says that his grandson is married to the granddaughter. Anybody remember the guys that are against this project? One guy's name is Tobiah, the other guy's name is San Ballad. This man's grandson is married to San Ballad's granddaughter. Wait, what does that say? It says this. That even if you were to have been raised by St. Ballot, you could still do a work for God. You see, so many times, and it is true, that your kids and your grandkids can drift away to the point where they would marry a St. Ballot's parent. Descendant. But did you know that just because they marry outside the faith does not mean that God couldn't all of a sudden save that entire family? That they might be living in sin right now, but God could take them and use them to build the wall? And one of you to look at it and say, no way, if you've married outside of my permission, then you can't be a part of this project. Wow. And here they are. The brothers, the children, building, because Jesus plus purpose equals unity. If any people should not have gotten along, it should have been the 12 disciples. You ever think about that? In the 12 disciples, we have a guy that's job prior to being a disciple was to go around and kill traitors. Right? That's what the challenge did. 
And then we had another guy who was a thug and sat on the corner and he would purposely take money away from his friends calling in taxes. And the two of them becomes unified in purpose. Because why? One Jesus. And when we have one Jesus, we can have one purpose. And when we have one purpose, all of the other things can disappear. And here we ought to in one surprise. Now I'm going to rush through this because I am out of time because Betty played too many songs. <laughs> Feel like you, Betty. All right, now here we go. I asked her to play more than that. But I told you I didn't know if I'd get through two verses. Right? And I, I, I said that. All right, so here we go. The priest shows up and they build the sheep gate. Now, first of all, what do you think they brought through that gate that gave it the name Sheep Gate? What do you think they did with the sheep? They were the sacrifices. In other words, this was the direct link from the person who needed to have their sins atoned to the place where their sins could be atoned because we know that the atonement came through the sheep, is that right? <laughs> through the sacrifice. And so this was the place, this was the gate. There is no other gate that they brought the sheep through for the sacrificial system than this one. Where better for the religious people to be working than bringing people straight to the altar? And so they start building the sheep gate. It says they go down to the Twin Towers. Anybody know there was Twin Towers in the Old Testament? And so they get to the Twin Towers. One was called the Hundred. Now the reason they think they called it the Hundred because it was a very large tower that could support a hundred troops. And it was in a very strategic place so that as they were coming back up the, the, the Jericho Road that they would be able to fend off troops at that particular place. But there was also a place called the Hanel. There was twin towers. One was to support and one was to defend. The other one was called God is gracious. So in the process of defending the temple, they needed to be gracious even to their enemy. It was the twin towers of strength and grace side by side. So in the process of exuding strength, we had better also offer grace. Because our God is an awesome, powerful God of grace. And he offered the grace. I've got at least 50 more slides for this program this morning. I'm not going to talk about any of them. Oh man, wait till next week. We'll finish it next week, I promise. This is what I want you to think about today. Jesus said, this is the church, and I will build my church. Now, my question is this in closing this morning. What church was he talking about? He was talking about me individually and us corporately. He wants to build the church. He wants to build you up. But together, we should be building each other up. But together, in our church, did you know that the church in the United States, the church, meaning evangelicalism in the United States, has the church growth has plateaued. Baptism has plateaued. What does that mean? We are losing as many members as we are gaining. As we, as we see people die, we do not see new people get saved and baptized. And we are seeing most churches have not only plateaued, but they are declining. In, in number in the church, this man, you probably see this all the time as you go from church to church, in number in the church and in significant impact in their city. How do we know that? Just watch television. What is the opinion of the people of Hollywood about the opinion of what they believe the people of Christ are? We're the crazy people. We're the nuts. We're the people that's always doing the wrong thing. We're the people that's always murdering somebody. We're the people that always are the bigot. And yet we are the people who are the most gracious. We are called the intolerant. And yet we're the ones who ought to show the most tolerance. It says, I will build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now this is what I believe. I believe he said that about us as individuals, but I said I believe he says that about every church that has ever been created for the express purpose of worshiping God and bringing people to him. So you know what that means? Jesus said it about West Side. This is my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against West Side unless what? We 
you stand there and just get tied to the shore and let the wind and let the waves bend. Jesus said, one of your brothers or sisters are caught in something like that. You who are spiritual should go release them. And in so doing, you build up the church. I'm not going to ask you to step forward and take on a ministry, but I'm going to ask you this. One time, a man was asked if he would pray for someone else. And Samuel said this, I will not sin against God by failing to pray for you. If we're not doing anything else but praying, it is absolutely sinful not to pray for this church to be built up by God. Maybe you're not the hand, maybe you're not the foot, maybe you're not the eye, but we're part of the body. Just do your body part well. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for today. And Lord, I want to thank you for Betty and what she does, the way in which she loves you and wants to uh, make you known through the medium of music. Just bless her in every way. Thank you for letting her be here today. And Father, we want to thank you for this wall building that we're learning through the book of Nehemiah. And Father, if any of us are here and are spiritual, like the priest, the high priest and the priests, let us start. Uh, regardless of whether or not anybody else gets involved. They didn't look around and say, who else is going to do it? They just saw what needed to be done in the area of worship and they just did it. Father, may we just do it for the glory of God. And I pray this in the name of the Father. Through the strength and connection and unity of the Spirit. Because of the oneness of